Good morning, Grace Chapel. Can you please begin by turning with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12? And before we begin, a couple quick notes. As Bill said, next week we're going to have a special offering for the Pregnancy Care Center, if you don't know what PCC stands for. And uh, so every year there's an opportunity for people to go and do the walk for life or the ride for life or the jog for life, depending on uh, how you want to do it. And it's a big fundraiser for a ministry that's local to our area, right? They're involved with helping uh, young mothers and fathers. They've got quite the facility there. We know next week uh, their, the new, their new director is going to be here to present. And uh, kind of right before this, um, this event, we would like to have a special offering. And so, again, we want to remind you of that next week, that there will be a second offering um, after the first one that will go directly to the Pregnancy Care Center. And it's a local ministry here. Again, we really want to be able to support them. Uh, in the past, we've done the Baby Bottle Blitz, which is nice, and that's a, a smaller thing. But being a ministry like this, in our backyard, impacting lives outside the church, uh, I think this is a really good thing for us to be able to give to. And so we want you to come with that in mind next week. Uh, That's something that we can give to. It's a good ministry and a way that we can do more than just voting pro-life. We can actually work to help um, babies and young mothers and different things in our community. And a, a second thought as well, is if there's, if there's anybody that's interested in being baptized that has not been baptized yet, we have a few people that are interested and we're talking about trying to get a group together, anybody that, would, that has not been baptized post your conversion. Uh, it's something we do as, as part of our church post conversion. If you were from a different camp before or, or whatever, we believe that baptism by immersion after salvation is the way that the, the New Testament outlines. And so if you are interested in being baptized, Please see me or Bill or Steve, uh, any of us, let us know. We're going to try to get a group together and make that happen. So if you're interested, please let us know. And if you haven't been baptized, you should be interested. All right? If you've professed faith in Christ, it's important. And with that said, I want to open this morning in prayer before we go to the text. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you so much for the gift of new members here at Grace Chapel that have entered into covenant to be a part of this church family. Uh, Lord, not just formally, or not just informally, but formally, these official members here. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for a beautiful day, the privilege that we have to set aside this time to gather and worship. Lord, I pray as we open this text this morning that you'd speak to our hearts through it. Lord, that you would convict us of sin where necessary. Lord, that we would become uh, more like Jesus as we sit under the preaching of your word this morning, that you would draw us to yourself, and that you would use this text in our lives for your greater glory and purpose in this earth. Lord, we thank you for your word to us, and we pray your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Lee Strobel, uh, best-selling author, award-winning author, in his famous book, The Case for Christ, recounts a story of a Chicago mobster from the 1970s by the name of Harry Alleman. Has anybody here heard of him? All right. I wasn't sure if he was big on the news before my time. I'd never heard of him before this. So Harry Alleman, he was uh, a Chicago mobster in the 1970s, and Lee Strobel describes him as being the quintessential crime syndicate hitman. They think he might have been responsible for the deaths of perhaps up to as many as 18 people, but being a part of the mob, he was really good at getting away with it. And so there was this one time, though, on September 27th, 1972, Harry Alleman murdered a labor union official. And at first he got away with it, but then two witnesses came forward. And as you can imagine, finding witnesses for a mobster is probably a little bit hard. Right? Like, who wants to testify against the guy that's going to have you killed? (laughs) Like, you got to be sure, as sure can be, that that you're going to have him convicted. And so there was two witnesses to this murder, and they came forward with eyewitness testimony that was corroborated. And on all accounts, it looked like it was an airtight case. And when they brought him before the judge, they skipped the jury, they went to the judge, and the judge pronounced him not guilty. Guilty. 
You have two eyewitness accounts that were perfectly corroborated saying, we saw this guy kill this other guy, and the judge says, well, I don't buy it. We're going to let him go. Years passed by, and then there were some people started looking into some of the courtroom corruption in Chicago. And the FBI ended up finding out many, many years later, this judge had been paid a sum of $10,000 in order to let this criminal go free. They bought his acquittal, essentially. And so the corrupt judge and the mobster both got away with their crimes for a number of years. Again, the murder was in 72. The trial was three years later in 75. And 15 years after this court case, when the judge realized that he, that he had been caught in retirement, he committed suicide. 15 years after his crime. And then 25 years after the murder, uh, which many years after the trial, Harry Alleman was retried and was sentenced to 300 years in prison. I'm sure we've all heard the saying, your sins will find you out. And these guys had gotten away with it for a period of time, but they didn't get away with it indefinitely. Our sins will find us out. I'm sure to some extent we've found this out even in our own lives. Maybe as a child you lied about something and then you end up finding out that you get caught a lot of times. A lot of kids learned it's easier to just tell the truth the first time because you're going to get found out anyways. So you might as well just do it right at first. Countless times in life people sin or they commit crimes or do so many different things and they think they've got away with it. And maybe in the natural, they have. But as we saw from last week's text, that God sees everything. And so even if people get away with things in this life, they stand before the judgment of God who sees everything that they do. God's judgment, his punishment, his his discipline, these things might be delayed, but God's delay, it's not God's indifference. And so one thing that God does, even with us as his people, As a God of grace, as he pursues after his people, anytime people fall into sin or rebellion against God, he pursues after them. Jesus even describes it being like a shepherd where where you leave the 99 to go after the one. This is what our God does. And so this is one of the reasons we need this text this morning. It's going to show us God's pursuit of his people even when we falter and fail. That God in his grace will not leave us to ourselves, but he will pursue after us to bring us back to himself. But before we dive in, I want to offer a quick recap. If you weren't here last week, we saw the tragic sin and utter failure of King David, right? David's life had been going incredibly well. Things were getting better and better and better. He had been ruling, he had been conquering the land, everything was going good. And then all of a sudden, a war erupts with the Ammonites to the east. And it just so happens that David decides to send the entire army away and remains back at Jerusalem. And one day when he was going for his mid-afternoon stroll atop the palace roof, he sees a beautiful woman bathing. So he sends and asks about her, finds out she's married, doesn't really care about that, takes her, commits adultery with her. And then when he finds out she's pregnant, he orchestrates this whole entire scheme so that, his, so that her husband would try to would get her pregnant was the hope, or would be the cover story at least. And when that failed, David determines, well, since I can't cover my sin this way, we're just going to have her husband Uriah killed in battle. We're going to orchestrate this all to cover over my sin. And we saw from last week's text that as far as human accounts went, David got away with it. Now, there might have been some people that were suspicious, like perhaps the servant that took her to the palace. I mean, that guy might have had some suspicions. You you can kind of connect some dots on occasion. But nobody knew for sure. And overall, David had gotten away with his sins. But the text ended last week with the statement that what David had done displeased the Lord. David had gotten away with it in the eyes of man, but God saw all of it. And even though God was seemingly absent throughout the passage, God was right there And David's sin was sure to find him out. 
And so we're going to see now that God is introduced, God is disapproving of what David had done. We're going to see what happens next. Look with me at chapter 12, verse 1. Scripture begins and says, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. So last week God saw, now God sends. Last week we saw that David was doing an awful lot of sending. Last week, David sent Joab. Last week, David sent to inquire about Bathsheba. Last week, David sent messengers to take Bathsheba. He sent word to Joab to get Uriah back home. Eventually, he sends Uriah back to the battle and sent him with a letter. And then when Uriah is killed, David sends to take Bathsheba as his wife. Last week, we see David doing an awful lot of sending while everybody else was seeming to watch. But now God is going to step into the picture. God was seemingly absent, but even though he was temporarily silent, God saw all of it. And now that David has done his sending, God is going to do his. God sent Nathan the prophet to David. This silence was about to be broken. Right? David thought he had gotten away with his sin, It wasn't quite the 25 years that Harry Alleman had gotten away with that murder. But we do know from last week's text that there was a baby that had come about. And I'm not an expert on those things, but last I checked, babies come nine, ten-ish months. Uh, For us, it's always two weeks more than expected. And for Ethan and Kaylee, it's more than you expect. But overall, nine or ten months. So David commits adultery, and you can assume that almost a year has gone by, and David has gotten away with it. As far as he knows, everything has all worked out. But this is not the case. Remember, God was displeased, and so God is going to send a prophet to confront his disobedient servant, David. It was an act of mercy that God doesn't send an enemy to kill David. Instead, he sends a prophet to confront. And so we'll see uh, how Nathan is going to get across to David. Look with me at the next part of verse 1. So Nathan comes to speak to David. And before we jump into this, I want to encourage us to see that Nathan does not tell David that he's about to tell him a parable. Okay? Nathan doesn't say, David, what I'm about to tell you is allegorical. Basically, what Nathan does is he comes to the king who is the judge over Israel, right? And so he would be the one determining matters. Who is right? Who is wrong? What's their punishment? David's the king, so he's the judge. And so you can see this, that Nathan comes to him and he says, David, we got a situation on our hands. There's this rascal that's out here. There's this horrible wretch out there, and we need to deal with him. David, Tell me what you think of this as the judge in Israel. And this is, da- this is Nathan's story that he reports to, to David. It says that Nathan came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. David, we have a situation on our hands. There is a horrible man on the loose in Israel, and this is what he has done. Now at the outset, we must note, if you want to get to the heart of a shepherd, you tell him a story involving sheep. David had spent many, many years of his life out in the wilderness with his harp out there dealing with sheep. So you want to hit him in the heart? You show up with this story about sheep. And again, Nathan doesn't tell him it's a parable. David thinks this is real life. And there are certain things in life, I'm sure, take us all back, 
right? You smell certain things and they, they remind you of memories. Maybe you smell apple pie and it reminds you of Sunday afternoons at grandma's house or you see a certain car and you remember your first car, right? There's different things in life that take you back to younger days. And I would dare say the thought of a little lamb would have done this for David. All of a sudden, he's no longer King David. He's that little forgotten shepherd boy, not the anointed king. He's the nobody out in the field, babysitting the sheep because nobody else wanted to do it. You bring up this story about a sheep and David goes back to his shepherd days. And was David a good shepherd? I would say yes. We know that there was at least two different times in David's life that he risked his life to save his sheep. A lion came and what's David do? He kills the lion to defend the sheep. A bear comes, what does David do? He kills the bear to defend his sheep. I don't know how many of us here today would be like that. I mean, if you give me a shotgun, sure. If you give me a slingshot and a bear shows up, that bear's getting dinner. I'm getting out of there, right? David cared about his sheep. He was willing to risk his life for those sheep. And so masterfully, God sends Nathan the prophet and orchestrates this story about this tiny little pet sheep that was so dear to this poor man. And some ironies here is this sheep, it says that the sheep lay in the arms of the man. Uh, Scholar Robert Chisholm points out this is the same word for lay that is used euphemistically. Uh, We've heard that before. And likewise, this lamb was like a daughter to the man. The Hebrew word for daughter is bat which is the beginning of Bathsheba's name. And so there's these interesting details in this story that are directed right at David, but somehow David is missing the picture. And this little sheep who was cared for so much by this poor man was taken to be the rich man's dinner. This rich man was introduced as having both flocks and herds, right? He's got sheep and he's got cattle. The rich man is doing very good for himself. Right? He's got a variety of animals, and he has an abundance of animals. And when a guest comes to the rich man, the rich man could have put on a feast. They could have had all sorts of variety. They could have had lamb chops. They could have had lamb roast. They could have had lamb leg. I don't know what else you cook from a lamb. They could have had that too. They could have had steaks. They could have had burgers. They could have had a pot roast. He has sheep, he's got cows, he's got it all in abundance. God's been good to this rich man. He's got so many things. And so when this visitor comes to town, this rich man is not willing to give even a small portion of what he has to prepare for this visitor. Instead, this rich man says, you know, I have all this stuff, but it's not enough. So I'm going to go to this poor man who has this one little pet sheep that drinks from the same cup. I mean, it's the affection this man has for the sheep, I would say, is rather disgusting. A lot of people here today probably have dogs that are basically children to you, right? People talk about being dog moms and dog whatever, I guess this would happen with sheep too. And sometimes you see people getting affectionate with their animals and you just, if you're not one of those people, you're like, man, that person, they love their whatever. Apparently this guy sure loved his sheep. It ate dinner with them. They shared cups together. It was a pet beyond all pets. It was like a child. It was his most prized possession. And the rich man who had all these things takes that one prized pet and makes it dinner. And we hear this story and you say, well, how could anybody be so cruel? Like, who turns pets into dinner? What horrible man would do something like that? What a monster would do that? So Nathan brings this story to David's attention, saying, David is the just judge in Israel. Won't you do something about this horrible man who's committed this terrible crime? David, what would you say should happen to the man who stole the pet lamb and made it dinner? Let's see what David says. Look with me at verse 5. It says, Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. 
And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. It's interesting that when you reframe David's sin like this, he sees it for what it is, isn't it? David didn't see his sin as so horrible until it's told in this allegorical form. And then all of a sudden he realizes this is a horrible thing. Who would do it? This guy has to pay. I would say it's a very interesting phenomenon that sin in life always looks worse in the lives of others than it does in our own, doesn't it? It's easy to look at the sins of other people and be like, man, they are horrible people. They just did X, Y, and Z. They are sinners. And then we look at ourselves, and if we're not careful, it's easy to look at our own sin and say, well, my sin isn't quite as bad as that. That sin is, that's like a 10. Mine's like a 2. Maybe it's still sin, but it's not that bad. And when we realize that we have sin in our own lives, if we're not careful, it's easy to rationalize and justify it. Why do we sin? Well, I was hungry, or I was angry, or I was lonely, or I was tired, or, or everybody does X, Y, and Z, so I might as well do it too, or it's, it's the normal thing today. It's easy for us to do all sorts of intellectual gymnastics to make our sin not seem sin to us. You look at other people's sin and it's ugly. We look at our own sin and we like to not look at it as sin. It could be easy to hold the, the judgment to other people, right, and hold their feet to the fire for the sin, but we all desire mercy for ourselves. You can imagine this is where David is. He's looking at this sin from a different perspective, from an external perspective. He realizes how horrible and wretched it is. And Nathan, it, un, under God's guidance, offers this wonderful approach. This, he takes the scenic route to get to David. Because you can imagine if Nathan the prophet just walked right up to David and said, Hey, David, I heard how you killed Uriah and took his wife as your own, and I think you're horrible. Do you think that would have worked? David had been a little irrational, right? So if you go and you just hit David with the truth, who's to say that David wouldn't have disposed of Nathan the prophet too? We hear this and everybody says, There's no way David wouldn't do something like that. Really? You see what he did last week. Took a man's wife, made her pregnant, killed the man, took the wife. So who's to say when David is being irrational and he's compounding his sins to try and cover up what he has done, who's to say that Nathan wouldn't be next on the list? So Nathan goes and takes this scenic route and he shares this story about this little lamb and basically David is the judge in Israel. You're supposed to administer justice. What would you do with a guy like this? And David responds and immediately brings up God. And isn't that the most ironic part of the whole story? As the Lord lives, this guy should die, is what David says. He brings God up immediately. We noticed last week David wasn't exactly inquiring of the Lord when he was inquiring about Bathsheba, now was he? But all of a sudden, when it's somebody else's sin, you bring God into the picture and he says, well, God, you know, as, as surely as God lives, this guy should die. Greater irony here is that David was the one that deserved the death penalty. Per the law, would somebody deserve to die for stealing someone else's pet sheep and barbecuing it? No, they wouldn't deserve to die. They would have to pay it back, but they wouldn't deserve to die. We saw in, in last week's text David plummeted to this horrible depth of sin in his life, and he broke four of the Ten Commandments. Two of those were supposed to be punished with the death penalty. If you were an adulterer, they would kill you. If you were a murderer, they would kill you. David had done both. David is the one that deserves to die. And David here cries out in judgment against this rich man and indicts himself because he, he was the one that deserved to die. And more so, he says that this man should repay four times this lamb. Scholars point out David would end up eating his own words as he would pay fourfold with the deaths of four of his own sons. And so at this point, David is utterly clueless, right? He's certainly passionate. This horrible wretch of this, of this rich man who stole this pet lamb, he ought to pay. 
He should die and he ought to pay. So David, as the, as the judge in Israel, trying to render justice, is probably there like, okay, Nathan, this guy deserves to pay. Who is it? Let's go get him. Let's see who has to pay. Look at me at verse 7. Scripture says that Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and you've killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. So David gets all emotional and says, this guy deserves, this guy has to pay. He should die. He should pay back four times. This guy is awful. We need to go get him. And then Nathan looks him square in the face and says, David, it's you. That horrible guy that you just heard about that did this awful thing in Israel that you realize needs, needs judgment, David, look in the mirror. You are the man. And in fact, reality is even worse than in the story because in the story, the, the poor man could have been repaid, at least a little bit. In real life, David didn't just steal from the poor man, David killed him. How are you going to repay that guy? You can't repay him, he's gone. And the good news this morning is that ultimately David had not gotten away with his sin. David thought he had, remember, a Probably about a year has gone by, and David thought he'd got away with it. But God loved David so much that he pursued this servant of his, even in his disobedience. See, for an entire year, David had been left to his own devices, to his self-deception, to his unconfessed sin, all these different things. And God went and in his grace pursued after David to restore him to right relationship with God. I'm sure we're all here today thankful for the grace of God that would leave behind the 99 to pursue after the one, that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost and to realize that all of us at one point have been lost and Jesus sought us out by his grace to bring us into the family. And in Nathan's address, he shows the root of David's sin. And this is really interesting. The root of David's sin here is actually that David wasn't content with the blessings of God in his life. Right? This string of horrible sins that David committed began with breaking the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. And I would dare say that everybody here this morning, when we think of big sins versus not so big sins, if you deal with covetousness, most people chalk that up to being not so bad. Yeah, I just covet, like, my coveting, what does it do? What does it hurt anybody? The fact that I'm jealous of what somebody else has, what harm does it do to them? Well, if you're king and you have the power, uh, it causes you to steal what they have and then kill them. That's what David did. So that's at the root of David's sin, is the fact that he wasn't content with the blessings of God in his life, because what Nathan goes on to do, which is so amazing to think, is he recounts God's blessings and God's goodness on David's life. Remember, David is the shepherd boy turned king. David was a nobody. He didn't even get invited to the meal that Samuel was at. When Samuel the prophet showed up and they said, look, we're looking for the new king of Israel, David wasn't invited. They didn't even include him. They invited every son but David. He's a nobody. And God had made him great. See, David, or Nathan goes and is confronting David and he re recounts all these things that God had done for him. First he says, God, God says this. He says, I, it's emphatic, I anointed you to be king over Israel. Think about this, David. Think about how good God has been in your life. I anointed you to be king over the is Israel. I saved your life countless times from the hand of Saul. How close David was right on the edge of death so many times. 
So many times his life was under threat. God spared his life time and time and time again. God gave him his master's house. The wives gave him the kingdom of Israel and Judah combined. God effectively says to David, David, I have been so good to you and it wasn't enough, was it? It's a pretty horrible way to to term it, isn't it? God says, David, I have been better to you beyond your wildest dreams. I have blessed you beyond measure. I've done all this for you. You didn't earn it or deserve it. The only reason that David was a success is that God was with him. That was the refrain of David's life, is that God was the one who made him a success. And after God had done so much to David, David effectively spits in the face of God's grace and says, it's not enough. I need one more wife. What I have, it's not good enough. Again, it was all rooted in covetousness. I would dare say this part we can relate to. I don't think anybody here can relate to the story where you commit adultery, have the husband murdered, and then take the wife. I hope not. If, <laughs> I certainly hope not. But the root of the sin, covetousness, I dare say a lot of us can relate to. And the only reason we don't steal and kill is because we don't have the power to do so because we aren't the king over an entire nation. I want to ask you this morning, Christian, are the blessings of God in your life enough? Has God been good enough to you? Because covetousness says to God, God, what you have given me in this life, it's not good enough. God, you haven't been good enough to me. I need more. Covetousness is a horrible sin. You covet somebody's spouse. You're saying to God, the spouse you've given to me, they're okay. God, you could have done better. You covet somebody else's house. And then in the next word, we say, God, we thank you for your blessings in my life. Are we truly thankful for the blessings of God in our life if we want the blessings that he's given to our neighbor? I dare say we're not thankful. I want to challenge us with this this morning because it was the root of David's sin is that he looked with longing on the things that other people had and he wasn't thankful for the blessings of God in his life. And I would dare say to all of us this morning, God has been good enough to you. Hasn't he? I don't think anybody would say out loud, God has not been good enough to me. Nobody would say that with words, but we say it all the time with our actions. The fact that God would take us who were far away from him and bring us into his kingdom to bless us with so many things we don't deserve, I can tell you God has been better to all of us than we could have ever earned or deserved. And we need to keep these things in mind when we are tempted towards covetousness. David despised the grace of God when he chose to take Bathsheba, kill her husband, and then take her permanently as his wife. The irony here is two weeks ago, we saw David on the receiving end of some despised grace. If you remember, the whole reason this Ammonite war started is because David sent some messengers to the new king of the Ammonites. Right, the Ammonite king, his, his father died, so he inherits the throne. And David says, I'm going to send some messengers to this guy, and I'm going to try to console him regarding the death of his father. And that king takes the messengers, shaves half their beards off, cuts their garments off at the hips, leaves them exposed, and sends them on their way. And David looked at that and realized, I tried to do something nice for this guy, and he spit in my face. He despised my grace. And then in the next chapter, David does the exact same thing to God. He says, God, you've been so good to me, but you haven't been good enough. Let's not be that to our Lord. And now our text is going to close in verses 10 through 15. Nathan continuing says this, he says, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and you've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. <clears throat> 
Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you, David, you did it secretly, but I, I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. God first said to David that he had despised the word of the Lord. And now it takes it a step further and says, David, you have despised me when you have done this. I love what Dale Davis, biblical commentator, says about this. He says, to despise Yahweh's word, however, is to despise the one who has given the word. To trample on his commandment is to trample on the commander. Think about that. Now, thankfully, God is a merciful and gracious God. Remember, David, on two accounts, deserved to die for his sin. But because God is gracious, God sends David a prophet to tell out some consequences. But David's life would be spared. Nevertheless, there were some consequences that were coming. We had seen in God's eternal covenant with David that the throne of Israel would always remain in David's house. But now we see that the sword will also remain forever in David's house. So we must note that David's sin with Bathsheba is the turning point of the entire story of 2 Samuel. If you look at 2 Samuel chapters 1 through chapter 10, can I tell you everything is getting better all the time. David's life is going good. He's anointed king. Then he's king over the whole kingdom. Then he's conquering. Everything is going great. There is nothing bad going on at all. David is blessed beyond measure. Chapter 11 David despises the grace of God, utterly scorns him, according to the text here, chooses to sin by taking Bathsheba, killing her husband, and you'll notice from chapter 12 through the end of 2 Samuel, David's life slowly spirals out of control. David was forgiven of his sin, but this did not spare him from the natural consequences of his sin. This is what we're going to see in the coming weeks. And so the sword is going to remain in his house, and God promises three judgments here specifically. The first one is the evil will come from within David's own house. The second punishment, the second consequence to David's sin is that David's wives will be given to his neighbor, and the neighbor will lie with them in the sight of the sun. David's sin occurred in secret. He thought he got away with it. And God says, look, you thought you could get away with your private sin We're going to put judgment for you on display. And in light of all this confrontation, we see David finally acknowledges his sin. The scripture reading this morning that Bill read came from Psalm 51. Psalm 51 was written in the aftermath of this confrontation where David acknowledges finally that he had sinned against the Lord. And David acknowledges not just his sin against Uriah, or against Bathsheba, but ultimately that his sin was directed at God. When we consider sin in our own lives, I want to remind us all, sin is first and foremost directed at God, before it's directed at other people. Anybody reading the story looks at it, and and even if you read Psalm 51, and David says, against you, Lord, only I've sinned, we see that and we say, really, David? I think you probably sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba too. Not a little bit, but a lot of it. But David realizes that his sin first and foremost is a transgression against a holy God who had entered into covenant with him and he was despising God's grace and rejecting God. I want to remind us, sin in our lives is an affront to God before it's an affront to anyone else. But David here is a model of repentance. And this is the one saving grace that we see today. See, David's repentance is, for one, what set him apart from King Saul. If you remember, Saul sinned multiple times in his leadership. And we saw this continual thing in Saul's life where when he was confronted by the prophet, Saul came up with excuses. 
Saul blamed other people. Saul always had a reason to not be the one who was guilty of his own sin. You never find in Saul's life a model of repentance at all. When David is confronted, David acknowledges, yes, I have sinned. I have done something wrong and horrible. I have sinned against the Lord first and foremost. And David is a model of repentance. Again, all of us at different points will falter in this life. And as such, repentance is a part of the Christian life. We all readily acknowledge that we're not perfect, but when we, those imperfections manifest in sin, we must remember to turn from our sins, to acknowledge that our sin is in fact sinful, to come into agreement with what God says about it, and to turn from that sin. I like what Richard Phillips, biblical commentator, says about this. He says, indeed, the mark of a spiritually lively Christian is not so much that we do not sin, but that we welcome God's calls to repentance when he shows us our sin. That we maintain a soft heart instead of a calloused heart. When we find out that we have sinned against the Lord and he convicts us by his Holy Spirit, that instead of doubling down and maintaining that sin as a lifestyle, we turn humbly and acknowledge our sins and we turn from them. But again, as I said a minute ago, repentance and forgiveness, they guarantee that we might be spared from the eternal consequences of our sin, but they don't always pardon us from all natural consequences to our sin. And we see the third punishment for David today is that the child that was conceived in adultery will die. Just as sure as David had utterly scorned the Lord in this horrible act, this child will surely die, and it will set forth a string of consequences that we will see in weeks to come. And so when we look at this passage today, we should learn this idea that when we sin and we despise God's grace, God is a gracious God, will seek us out and draw us to repentance. Now, God might not send a prophet today to tell you a parable But every time we open God's word, God works in our hearts to reveal our sin to us, convicting us by his Holy Spirit that we might turn to him. That's why we need to be in the word. Every Sunday you come, you hear the word. When you're at home, you should be in the word. And God uses that word almost like a mirror to show us the areas that we have that are outside of his lordship, those areas that we need to fix. This is God's desire for us today. And again, the good news is that God is a gracious God. We saw how David was sought out by the grace of God. David, even writing later, says, The Lord, he's a merciful and gracious God. He is slow to anger, and he's abounding in steadfast love. God in his nature is gracious and forgiving towards us, which is good news because, can I tell you this morning, we need it. We need it the grace of our God. Not one of us is exempt from needing grace from God. The prophet Isaiah many years ago wrote that all of us like sheep, we've all gone astray, we've all turned everyone to our own way, but the Lord laid upon him, that is Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. The good news this morning is that while all of us have sinned, and whether or not we've sinned at that high level that David did, or even a smaller level, the good news is that while all of us have sinned, God has provided for us a means of forgiveness that we all need. See, Jesus Christ, he's the Lamb of God. He's the Son of God. He came to take away the sins of the world, suffering the punishment for sin that you and I deserve so that we can be spared and forgiven from the wrath of God. In today's text, we saw this heartbreak of this poor man in this story, right? Who had this little lamb that was taken away from him by this rich man and turned to be dinner. Scripture says that this lamb was like a daughter to him. Can I tell you that God so loved you and me that he didn't spare his own son for us? He wasn't just like a son, he wasn't just a pet. He was the son of God. He was heaven's very best, was given on behalf of our sin. That is how gracious our God is. 
that He was willing to give His own Son that we might be saved from His wrath that was to come. And again, all of us, we might still face natural consequences for our sins. Sometimes people get caught in the crossfire, all these different things. But through Jesus Christ, you can be spared of every eternal consequence of your sin. Scripture says that the wages of sin is death. Ultimately, all death in creation came about through sin. And ultimately, there is that eternal spiritual death, separation from God, that is going to happen to everybody that does not find forgiveness through Jesus Christ. When I ask you this morning, have you received this forgiveness today? Because all of us need it. You can hide sin in this life. You can hide sin from your spouse. You can hide sin from your boss. You can hide it from your cousin or anybody else. But God sees all of it. And there is a day coming when all of us will have to give an account for the lives that we lived before an all-seeing and all-knowing God. And on that day, we desperately need the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ if we are to make it through God's judgment. And if you don't know where you stand with God today, I would love to speak with you after the service because all of us need forgiveness through the Lord. In closing, I'd like to share a few takeaways with you all this morning. First, what do we learn about God? Again, we learn that God pursues his people despite their sin. God's love and grace is so great that he doesn't leave us alone. He doesn't just say, well, they messed up, they're out there, and they're just going to do their own thing, and I'm going to give up on them. God's grace is so great that he doesn't give up on us. And he pursues after us to restore us in relationship to himself. What do we learn for us? Well, first, again, I want to remind us that sin is often rooted in discontentment. The act of coveting something is essentially telling God, what you've given me, it's not enough. We want to keep our eyes out on this because, again, all of us will struggle with certain things in this life, and oftentimes this is what's at the root. And as God reveals sin to us, I want to challenge us on this idea of repentance because God will reveal our sin to us. If you have a heart that is submitted to Christ as your Lord and the Holy Spirit comes to you and convicts you of sin, it's going to happen for all of us. And when God does this, we must be willing to genuinely repent of our sins. As you open God's word, as you sit under God's word every Sunday, if you listen to people on YouTube like I do, God works through all of these means to reveal our sins to us. Not one of us has it right across the board. Thankfully, no one here killing, adultering, murdering, as far as I'm aware. But all of us struggle with something. And when God speaks to us through his word and reveals our sin by his Holy Spirit, we must respond to the conviction of his spirit with repentance. Again, repentance isn't just something that is reserved for the beginning of the Christian life. If it was, then you would have the sense that we're perfect the rest of the time, which is certainly not true. Remember, God desires us to be his holy and set apart people. And for us to be able to grow, to be more like Jesus, when these sins come to our, to our knowledge, We have to acknowledge that their sin, as God's word says, and we have to change our mind around these. That's that's what repentance means. And then a change of mind has to result in a change of action for it to be genuine. John the Baptist, when he was addressing the religious leaders, told them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you're truly sorry that you've done something, you're going to change. You can't do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and say, God, I'm sorry, I did it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. If you're sorry, you're not going to be doing it again and again and again and again. So we need God to change our hearts that we would hate the sin in our life just as much as he does. And again, we're not going to be perfect. We know this. But when he brings these things to our minds, we have to come into agreement, acknowledging their sin and turn from them. And the good news is, John wrote in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is good news this morning. There is no sin that is beyond the grace of Jesus Christ. He's able to forgive us of all of these things in our lives. We know God is a gracious and merciful God, and we should thank him for that. But when I challenge us this morning, we ought not to despise his grace. The grace of God, the kindness of God is meant to draw us to repentance. 
knowing that he is forgiving, instead of using that as a license to sin, this grace that God has, his kindness, it should not lead us to presumption, but it should lead us to genuine repentance. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this text. Lord, I thank you for the variety that we get from your word, that there are Sundays that we can be encouraged, that there are Sundays that we can be challenged. Lord, that you address all these different areas of need in our lives. God, I pray if there be anybody here today that is struggling with a besetting sin, that by your grace you would free them from that. Lord, we know that your word teaches us that we are free from the power of sin, that we are no longer slaves to sin as those who are outside of Christ, but we are slaves to righteousness. And God, that we're not going to be perfect this side of glory, but Lord, you definitely desire to see a change in us. Lord, I pray you would work in our hearts that you would bring to us a conviction of our sins by your Holy Spirit, and that we would turn from those sins, that we would acknowledge they are sins just as you see them, and that we would change, Lord, by your grace, the empowerment of your Spirit within us, that we would walk in that newness of life, that we could be lights in this world. Lord, we thank you for your word today. God, I pray you'd strengthen us with the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And God, you would use us to be lights to this world or with the lives that we lead. Father, we ask your hand for your help at work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.